What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. Thanks for tuning in. Excited about today. Got a really good buddy on the show, um, and we're going to talk striper fishing in Weldon, North Carolina, which is uh, kind of the upper reaches of the Roanoke where these fish um, will come up to spawn from the Albemarle Sound. Really incredible fishery here in North Carolina. It's definitely, I feel like this podcast is going to have a lot more traction locally, um, but if you live near North Carolina, this is a destination that you should definitely travel to in the spring. Um, incredible fishing, you know, hundred fish days are not uncommon. But before we get into that too much, I'm gonna I'm just gonna do a little bit of the pre-show stuff real quick. If you haven't checked out our Patreon page, go check it out. I'm doing a lot of giveaways through Patreon. Uh, you can do five dollar donations a month or ten dollars a month or a custom donation um, of your choice, and and that allows you to uh, be parts of these giveaways and and custom uh, Patreon content that is on its way um, just for the Patreon member so check that out it just helps us out it blesses us big time during this hard uh hard time financially right now and so um it's just a big help and a way to support the show if you do really love it if you still love it and you can't swing it no worries at all keep checking out the the podcast check out the youtube videos and we love we love our viewers and listeners either way so um just wanted to put that out there the other thing is check out uh eastern current fishing on facebook it's a it's a group for the listeners and viewers to you know communicate with each other and hopefully uh, be able to get out in the water with some some like-minded individuals. But that's enough of me talking. I'm going to bring on our special guest, our very special guest, John Smolko. What's on, man? What's going on, man? <laughs> oh, not much. Just surviving the big rainstorms and hanging out. I know, man. It's a gnarly storm. I guess it hit y'all last night up in Asheville, and it's, uh, it's working its way to us. Yeah, so y'all stay safe down that way. Yeah, we'll try to. We'll try to. It's, uh, it's a gnarly-looking band. Is it a, is it a cold front? Is it cooler today out there? No, it's about the same. About the same, just a big thunderstorm uh, band, kind of. Yeah, just a big, big storm front coming right. across. So, right on. Yeah, crazy, crazy weather for sure. Well, me and John met. Well, we met through. I guess we both did some field marketing work for for Yeti coolers for a little while, um, and we didn't yeah. meet because yeah, of been, that. We met on the side of the been, road. We had been acquainted <laughs> for a long time before yeah. we met through uh, a friend of ours, Griffin, and and uh stuff way way back yeah when i lived in raleigh even um and yeah and then all the yeti stuff and then um yeah finally ended up getting to getting to hang out yeah definitely i'm gonna tell this story real quick really short version of it i i called john one day or i hit him up on instagram because i blew a tire out like in the middle of probably about an hour outside of memphis and i was like who do i know that's in memphis who do i know and i was like oh john's there and we had never actually hung out and i texted him and the dude travels around town finds this this a special key I need to get my lugs off of my uh, off my tires. I had two tow trucks come that couldn't help me, and John drives all the way out there, helps me change a tire, and I get into town. And he's just he's a solid dude all around. Um, but yeah, that was our first like this was probably five years ago, maybe four years yeah, that's ago. It's been a while. Yeah, it's middle of duck season over over in Arkansas. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess yeah, you're just back in Memphis by chance for like the evening or something like that. And so yeah. Um, yeah, that was nuts. That was nuts. We actually broke down right in front of like a, one of Browning's hunting impoundments out there. So we were just watching mallards and geese pour into this impoundment while we we're sitting there with a the tire blown out on the side of the road. But, um, but yeah, so since then we've we've uh, we've done a lot of guiding together up in Weldon. So that's kind of the only place that our guiding paths interact is in is in Weldon, North Carolina. Uh, John, why don't you tell people before we get into it, a little bit about your like how you got into fishing, um, how you became a fishing guide, and, and that kind of whole story. Yeah, I mean, the outdoors have been a big part of my life since day one. There's a photo of my dad holding me on a boat. It is Duck Club on the eastern shore of Maryland back when I was about a year old. Yeah. Uh, he was always real involved in conservation and have a long history of being involved in that. Uh, first memory of fishing was at Bill Dance's Junior Fishing Rodeo. I was about four years old um, catching That's catfish awesome. on, on hot dogs with crawfish attractant <laughs> uh, back in, in Memphis. Uh, but yeah, just always, always been a big part of uh, my life, whatever it was sailing or motorcycles or hunting or fishing. I was always outside doing stuff. Uh, and then started going to Eastern North Carolina, about uh, your way up uh, Lower Noose River, working for Camp Seagull. And then I ended up running a fishing program for them for a number of years, uh, taking kids, um, anything from fishing the golf course ponds for bass and bluegill. And then the oldest kids, we'd take them offshore and and catch all the big fun stuff Heck yeah. um, and then f- from there just kind of kept it rolling after i graduated college wasn't ready to give it up and and uh lucky to make a kind of a career out of it for the last eight ten years yeah that's awesome you 
definitely a, uh, a traveling traveling uh, outdoorsman for sure. My traveling days have kind of shut down ever since I got married. But it's, you know, there's a season for it. And then you kind of find where you want to be and you just settle into it for some of us. And for others, there's not. But um, that's, right. that, that's uh, they, you were saying the other day on the phone that they, uh, they canceled y'all's Alaska season. Is that kind of across the board for most of the lodges up in Alaska? Or was that a decision that Tick Chick made individually? Uh, it's a decision that our lodge made. Uh, mostly due to the uncertainty, had some cancellations, but now's the time we're really starting to get geared up. Uh, we're really remote, so you have to fly everything in. It's not like uh, you can just pick it up and, and get things going in a couple days. It's it's about a month and a half of prep work to get everything ready, and with kind of the uncertainty and the travel restrictions that are going on in Alaska and just the unknowns, I think it's a lot easier just to to shut it down for now. But there's other places up there that are still – looking to go this year some places their season starts in july as opposed to june so they're kind of holding out to see what happens um so alaska's not totally shut down but uh not not looking good for me to make a another trip up there this year yeah i hear you it's yeah there's i can imagine just with all the the fly out stuff it just is going to make it so tough with what's going on and yeah, you know yeah. for clients a little scary like all these confined spaces everything's being touched by multiple people just to get to that one place i mean if the sickness is still around or the virus it's it's something that would be it would yeah, well, one it would suck to get there <laughs> yeah know? and then you're a long way from any kind of reasonable health care when right. you are out there right so exactly. you know how it goes you're just around the corner when you were up there i was man i miss it i wish i could go up there for like two weeks a year i probably would still do it but it's like you said it's a journey to get up even just to get mm-hmm. get there so um yeah it's, it's i think that was just my that, that time's done but uh, well cool so you're in Asheville right now Asheville's home base for you but I mean, yep. I, I swear when I talk to you more times than not, you're not anywhere near Asheville. You're in other places. So, but um, you you do you started doing some musky guiding up there, right? Yeah, running a few trips here and there just to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, yeah. Do a bunch of traveling, um, photography work, marketing work. In the winter time, I'm in Mississippi guiding duck hunts down there, um, welding, and then Alaska. So always on the move. Uh, about average, probably about 300 days a year on the road. Um, it's a rambling man. So, so keeping after it, but yeah, trying to, like you said, eventually kind of find some things and settle down. So trying to spend some more time here. So trying to pick up some musky trips. Yeah, definitely. Here and there, and uh, when the river allows, and uh, yeah, let's make it happen. Yeah, the river's probably gonna be pretty angry today in the next couple of days from all that rain. But yeah, it came up about six feet overnight. Did it really? <laughs> Golly. <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about, or what we're going to talk about for the most part the whole time is, is welding and, and kind of, I think what would be a cool way to start is kind of like our forecast or broadcast of what we feel like this season is going to bring. Um, John and I both have available dates still, so you might listen to this podcast later. Um, but if you're, if you listen to it before Weldon, we both have available dates still. We've had some cancellations due to the coronavirus, but they're going to keep that ramp open there. And, uh, you know, we're taking special precautions with our clients on the boat, cleaning everything, uh, making sure it's going to be a safe way for people to recreate and not go crazy during this time. Um, but hit us up. I mean, we'd love to get out on the water with you. If you've never checked out that fishery, it's an incredible fishery. And, uh, I'm gonna let John kind of take over here and, Tell them kind of what we've seen the past couple of years, water level wise and fishing wise, and like how you think this year is going to be a little different um, due to the water levels. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to see what's going to happen this year. Uh, it's been a lot of low water. Uh, with the warm weather, you would have thought it would have gone a little early. Yeah. But that doesn't seem to be the case. It still seems to be on time. I think mostly because there's just been such low water, the fish have been waiting on a pulse of water to really push up there and, and get it going. Uh, but once they get up there, it, it might it might happen really fast. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. The last few years, there's been so much rain. We've been fishing in flows of 20 and 30,000, whereas the first couple of years I was up there, we were seeing more um, around six to 8,000, which is what they're running about now. Uh, but with the rain that's kind of sweeping over that way today and, and whatever happens in the next two weeks, it'll be kind of interesting to see what it's like when we get there. Definitely. I feel like I get nervous every year with the weld and fishing, just like I do with turkey hunting where I'm like, golly, it's hot. I'm afraid that these fish are going to like, I've got all these trips booked into mid May. Like, are they going to still be doing it? Uh, Last year, like mid May, it kind of started to taper off pretty good. At least I feel like when we Mm -hmm. left, 
it had tapered pretty good. And there was like another little pulse like a week after we left where it fished really good. Um, yeah. But I mean, historically, year after year, like you can catch them from the beginning of April to the end of May, like pretty darn six, like, you know, pretty darn well. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, with the lower water, it definitely limits. John's got a jet boat, which is really cool up there. It, it allows him to, to fish a lot of the stuff that, that we can't fish. I, I take my flats boat up there and, um, I get very tempted to try to get it in areas that I shouldn't get. I need to start a photo series of just like places the flat skiff shouldn't be, like tied up against right. a bunch of barnacles, sheep's head fishing, or yeah. you know, sitting in it. That time I was last year, I was Eddie sitting down. behind you in that that gnarly yeah, Eddie. Eddie. Eddie down behind a big rock. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Golly, man. It's, it's, I broke my skeg off last year. I'm, I just I can't push it this year anymore. Um, well, cool. Well, let's talk a little bit more about, so with that lower water, the fish are going to be more concentrated, like from the boat ramp and Weldon down, you know, that first three to five miles for the most part. Um, and we both do a lot of fly fishing and light tackle, but what are you looking for? Like when you hit the river, um, in the morning as far as, well, let's, let's say not just each morning. First off, what kind of spots are these striper wanting to hold in, um, when they're feeding in this river? Really any kind of structure just as you would uh fish for any any fish really um not so much on the current breaks um but any kind of structure um so confluences rocks it's a lot more similar to trout fishing in the mountains or smallmouth bass fishing would yeah. be a really good, good way to put it um like river style smallmouth bass fishing um, where they're going to be behind rocks um humps in the bottom of the river the thing about Weldon, why they're called rockfish, is it's the first first place if you go up the Roanoke River where the sand bottom really starts hitting some rocks. So that's what they're looking at. They need those rocks to spawn. Um, but they'll be holding you know, humps in the bottom of the river, behind rocks, um, down trees, logs, anything like that. Yeah, uh, it's a good place for them to be. Definitely. It's uh, if you do use sonar up there much or or a, a fish finder, it's funny because it's like there's t- the fish move so much up there throughout a day so it's like in the morning sometimes they'll be like suspended all through the water column out in the middle of the river so when you're up there fishing i feel like it's very important to one if you have a depth finder or a fish finder use that um to, to kind of locate and and well here's before i even say that if you if you have higher flows like we've had last year and the year before like depth finders didn't do crap because those fish were up in six feet of water you weren't you weren't really yeah. locating on that. You're fishing that shallow fast never, water. I've You've never, never used, used a no. fish finder up there and still do do I. But I did get uh I got one of the castable ones this oh, year. Oh, you got a castable one? You were talking about it last year. So, yeah, so I'm interested to to use that and see how it goes. Have you played year. around with it already? A little bit. I was uh, chucking it over some musky holes, seeing if there was any fish down there, just oh, kind of trying to get familiarize myself with it. Yeah, that's um, but I'm excited cool. to excited to have that. So, uh, there are the with, Especially with the water being low, it, it the fish finder definitely helps more below the ramp than yes, above the ramp. Definitely. Yeah, when the fish orient below the ramp, there's a lot of, me and John will communicate a lot. When they're upriver, I'm like, all right, hey, where are they? When they're downriver, he's like, what is your fish finder telling you? <laughs> are they sitting in the middle of the river? What are they doing? So, um, But yeah, so I think most of the fishing, except for people with jet boats, is probably going to be from the ramp down um, this season. And so in that deeper water locating the fish a lot of mornings i'll just idle down river until i start marking them really well and then i'll start fishing those areas like if you're not marking them in that deeper water you you really don't need to fish for them um, yep. and it, a lot of times when they're really when they're marking really well up near the surface um there's like two ways it goes it's like they're gonna crush top water or you're not gonna be able to get them to eat anything um, yeah when they're when they're suspended or up up high it's pretty it can be tough to get them to eat sometimes can, especially can. middle of the day or later in the morning, definitely middle of the day, or if they're in, in that spawning mode, man, where they're they, they can just be tough to get them to bite. But um, well, let's talk a little bit about presentation. Let's start with the fly first. Like I, I've, that's our passions. I feel like it's fly fishing, and I with this podcast, mm-hmm. I talk a lot about um, light tackle and whatnot. But I really want to on this on this podcast talk more and focus a little bit more on the fly fishing. So when you are, you know, what what are your setups and kind of how are you targeting these fish on the fly rod? So I'm fishing two guys at a time, and I'm running about six rods, six fly rods, um, and then I always take a spinning rod just for prospecting. Yeah. You know, just bouncing around. Well, um, that's what we call pl- it at least is prospecting. Yeah, but when soft, we need to get soft plastics for prospecting. Um, you can cover a lot more water quickly with that spinning rod and uh, figure out, you know, presentations, depths, and and really kind of 
kind of figure out what you need to do. But for fly tackle, I'm running six rods, pretty much three per person. I'm running one with the full sink, probably about 350 grains on a nine weight. Uh, so I'm running a full sink and then intermediate sink and then floating lines. So two of each set up, um, one for each person fishing with me. Um, the, that floating line, I might either run a long leader with like a clouser minute on it, or I might run a top water on it. Yeah. Um, but that having, having a rod set up each way is, is good because depending on where the fish are in the water column, you can get to them, um, without using a whole lot of other weight on the fly rod and keeping it easy to use. Yeah, that's uh, that's huge. I think being able to just switch really quickly like that, um, depending upon what you're, what you're seeing is important. And I mean, I guess you could also run different spools. Like if you don't have multiple rods, you know, and you're going to fish, fishing, um, or you're going to target those striped bass up there, just buying different spools for your, your rod and being able to swap out is, can be, yeah. you know, is just as good. So but you definitely at least want something sinking and something surface oriented because yeah, at least having two setups is good. Yeah, and, and one of the things that that John can do with his jet boat that that is uh, a little different than everyone else too is he's got oar locks on that boat, and so he's able to kind of slowly work through an area. And you can do it with a trolling motor, but it's definitely tougher to kind of really for for fly fishing. I don't think you can beat the oar locks up there. Um, talk a little bit about how those kind of come into play when you're when you're working down the river looking for those fish. Yeah, you can just work on your boat positioning a whole lot better um, as far as where you want to be in the river holding the boat um, in a particular way so that people can make a presentation. I feel like with with a trolling motor, sometimes you're kind of like zigzagging down the river trying to keep it. And uh, a lot of times you might just want to drift completely sideways, Yeah, um, which is a bit tougher to do with a trolling motor sitting sideways and then staying on the on the track that you want to do whereas with the oars i can kind of just push across or pull it back yeah um yeah because when those when those fish are really deep you're pretty much casting up river and just letting it sink oh yeah for a long time long time until you uh that's how you i'll end up usually catching sticks too but it's when yeah when you got to get way down man that's the ticket that's there's a lot of wood there so um, yeah, as far as with, with flies being that there's a lot of stuff to hang up on, just cheap flies. Very flies cheap flies. Nose, um, really easy stuff to tie at home. Um, don't, you're going to lose a bunch of tackle, so don't bring, you know, ev- everyone loves some game changers, but if, unless you got a whole bunch of money to, to bury at the bottom of the river, I'd keep it simple. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you. We've got one buddy who, awesome dude, but he, he fishes, I mean, he ties all his own flies. Yeah, but uh, but tricky. He uh, he fishes some fancy stuff up there. He's brave. Yeah, he does. I'm like, I, I always tell myself to, right, I'm gonna tie 100 clousers. I need to start tying clousers. I, I start thinking about it like March, and yeah. then time rolls around, and I'm like, I'll tie five, and I'm like, golly, I don't want to tie 50 more clousers, and I go buy them. So today, when I'm done with this podcast, I think I'm gonna sit down and tie a bunch of clousers because yeah. I end up spending like 75 dollars on freaking clousers when they're the easiest fly to tie. But it's just my procrastination puts me puts yeah. me uh behind so yeah about um, yeah february when stuff hadn't started kicked off that's when i'll sit down and just just crush them let's talk a little bit about um your retrieves first subsurface um, with sinking line on the fly and then talk about you know fishing poppers and stuff like that but when you're uh when you're targeting the red, the not redfish but the the striped bass like how are you let's talk about the presentation and how you're throwing the fly deal, dealing with the current and how you're stripping it all that uh, there's some different ways to do it. If you're fishing kind of cross current, real more streamer trout fishing style, mm-hmm. um, it works well if you're floating the river. Um, that way, kind of <clears throat> looking for fish, casting out and retrieving back. But most of the time there, what we're going to do is float sideways down the river in the lower river. Um, <clears throat> I guess that's a better way to break it up. You've got kind of the upper river. That's one of the cool things about it is the, from the boat ramp up is completely different than the boat ramp down. It's like two yeah. totally different rivers fishing it, which is a lot of fun for us. Um, if you're below the boat ramp, like I said, most people will probably be down there this year. A lot of guys are just going to float sideways, um, cast upstream, and then just let it sink. And then uh, give it probably a, a 10 count or you know just about whatever you think with the water depth, depending on the water level, um, is going to be. You're going to let it sink down to those fish. A um, couple strips to retrieve, and then you might let it sink back down. A couple strips, just keeping it up off the bottom, off that wood. 
um, and then retrieve it all the way back up, cast it out again. Um, so that's one way to do it. If you're upstream, it's going to be very much picking spots, um, buckets behind rocks, into trees, up on the bank, uh, anywhere that you see any kind of busting fish or activity casting there. Yeah. Um, sinking lines. Yeah, heck yeah. I think uh, one of the big parts of, with the fly rod downriver um, and drifting is, you, I mean, anytime you're fly fishing and you're trying to get your fly down with sinking line, moving with the fly is way easier than sitting stationary. Because yeah. sitting stationary, yeah. you've got to do what's called mending and, and you're really working hard to get that fly down. But if you're drifting with it, you can get a dumpy cast out there and let it sit and just count it down and then strip it back up off the bottom. Right. Yeah. It's, it feels it's like tough. when that. Oh, sorry. What were with saying? all that current down there, it's it's tough to mend with that sinking line. It definitely is. Definitely so anchoring is. it up, unless you're on a school of fish that you know is not moving and they're kind of up off the bottom a little bit, it's much better to float over the top of them, yeah. let it sink all the way down to get to them, and then just run laps as opposed to anchoring up and trying to, to sink a, For a sure. line all the way down there. Yeah, there'll be days where all of us guides are in there just running laps. It'll be like 20 boats in a mile stretch of river, but everyone understands how it works, and you're just kind of flowing and flowing and um, and then you get the guys in like the 24 foot center consoles that, that come like they, it's better to just run back up river, you know, after you're done fishing or oh, idle. Yeah. idle's great, but you get the plowers and like the 23 foot center consoles that are yeah. <laughs> like three foot wakes that are, doing your favor. yeah, that, yeah they're not doing 16 foot aluminum John boat. It's uh, <laughs> a little scary. A little hairy sometimes. It is a little hairy. So when do you like to throw a top water there? And if so, like, what do you throw in, um, as far as fly rod goes? And how are you how are you working that that fly? So on everything, I'm running eight nine weights. I'll bring a couple sevens, um, mostly eight nines because of the current. Most of your average fish you're going to catch there are going to be in about the 18, 17 to twenty inch range. It's what we've seen a lot of in the past couple of years. Past two years have been really good size wise, and I think this year probably bodes pretty well for that again. Um, so eights and nines. You can probably get away with the seven, but mostly it's because of current. And another thing is if you do hook a big fish, you're going to want that bigger rod. Yeah. Uh, there are big fish there, a lot of really big fish. Uh, but the smaller males, the schoolies, are so much more aggressive. That's what you're going to catch mostly. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so when you're top water, it's going to be early morning. You're looking for fish busting. Or a lot of times, even if you get to a spot, maybe you fished it the day before, and you're pretty confident that there's going to be some fish in there at a confluence or behind a tr- particular bend or behind a rock or something like that you might just kind of toss that top water out there and see if you can get anything to um, to take a whack at it yeah um do you uh do you have any colors as far as your flies go that you really like with whether it's your bait fish or your clouds or or your uh your top water flies um all the colors always with white white and white blue and white red and white pink and white chartreuse and white um even chartreuse and blue um, doesn't seem to make a huge bit of difference. Yeah. Um, but if if one stops working or slowing down, it's worth changing it up and, and trying something different. Yeah. To see what happens. Yeah, I'd agree. I feel like with the fly, it's like typically an attractor color. I mean, you talk to anyone that striper fishes anywhere, it's usually like white, pink, and chartreuse, and then maybe a natural color. And that's kind of what 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 I do with my flies as well. So. Um, yeah, if you look at anybody's, it's not like there's any secret baits up there. It's really just a lot of fish and just getting your bait in front of them while they're feeding is, is, the, is mm-hmm. the ticket getting whatever you're throwing in front of them or just fishing live shad or shiners on the bottom and catch them all day long <laughs> yeah but um well cool yeah. well, let's 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 uh dive into you know the the spin fishing aspect of it because i feel like a lot more people will get up there and do that and and before we switch over to i will say like if you are you know say you've got an eight weight fly rod and you want to start throwing it like this is a great place if you live in north carolina yeah Tennessee, Virginia, South Carolina, to go and learn to throw the fly rod well. Like it's a rewarding place, and and anybody yep. can go up there, and within you know an hour or two have it figured out enough that they can they can catch some fish. It's a good place to practice hook sets, strip sets, and yeah. and playing yep. a fish. Yeah, strip sets, big or big, big strip sets. But yeah, like I said, it's a great place for um, beginner fly anglers, um, even kids if they want to spin fish to go up there. Um, yeah, like I said, because it's gonna be a really rewarding experience with not too much effort there's a lot of margin definitely. for error definitely well uh with that being said about the fly fishing let's talk a little bit about um, what we like to throw on the spinning rods and i will say i'm not going to tell anybody our secret spot but there's one spot that we always hold out and get uh, these these super cheap but incredible soft plastic flukes 
um, up there. I'll give them this much this much uh, advice. It's a drugstore. So if you if you bop around between enough drugstores in Roanoke Rapids and Weldon, you will find the mother load of cheap soft plastics that are extremely durable. But um, yeah, there's that there's that photo of me just chucking them up in the air. <laughs> yeah, just thousands of them. <laughs> On the air. It's uh, I think it's what is it? It's like a hundred for like fifteen bucks or something or thirty so, bucks. Something crazy. Something crazy. Something crazy. Yeah, and they're uh, like five inch fluke soft plastics and chartreuse and white, but. That's pretty much all you need to know, but let's let's dive a little bit more into detail and kind of how how you work those baits. So if you're just throwing a spinning rod, you got spin clients on the boat. What's kind of your your play? What do you what do you have rigged on? What are you throwing? Um, so I'm running typically anything about a 2,500 3,000. Yeah, um, kind of like your standard trout setup for yeah. inshore fishing, and then running anywhere 10 to 15 pound braid. Um, on there and then i'm running a fluorocarbon leader uh 12 15 pounds something like that um, you want to be able to break it off yeah um, you're going to get hung up you're going to lose baits you're going to lose jig heads um, similar to the uh clouds or flies and everything we're talking about that way um, be ready to lose a bunch of tackle yep. so um, cheap stuff is your friend that's right. there oh. <clears throat> so we're going to hit spots. We're going to cast towards the bank um, and retrieve, um, swinging it kind of uh, like fly style. You're going to go perpendicular or 45 degrees downstream and then just kind of let it swing through the current. You can kind of let it drift to help get it down and then retrieve it with some twitches. Uh, um, and some days they just they want it a certain way. You're going to have to figure out what works. Some days they'll hit it as soon as it hits the water, no matter how much they want it. Some days... Um, like you and I've been out there fishing, and you're out fishing me ten to one, because you have just that perfect twitch figured out, and I don't quite have it there. Yeah, so it's they can funny. be they can be really picky, and if you get it right, you're going to catch them all day. So you got to figure out what they want and how they want that presentation. Um, but yeah, mostly a lot of soft plastics and swim baits. I know Alan loves some swim baits up there. Yeah. Um, spooks, top water, any kind of poppers, any, anything like that. Um, so just have a pretty good good arsenal that way. The one thing that I, I think is important to remember, um, and I forget this sometimes when I'm up there, and if you're a game warden listening to this, I'm sorry, but it is a barbless and a single hook single area. Hook. The single, single hook barbless. I don't forget, but the barbless, sometimes I'm, I, I hook a fish, I'm trying to pop it out, I'm like, God, I forgot to clamp the barbs. So make sure you're clamping those barbs up there. It's safe for those fish. You're catching typically so many fish. So they're just trying to cut down on, on you know, fish kill, you know, unnecessary yeah, hook, fish kill. Hooking mortality. So. Hooking mortality. Yeah, and especially with the spooks and the top water stuff, get a get a pair of snap ring pliers and yep. just swap them out. Put a single hook on the back. Um, they love to short strike. Yeah. At at the spooks and stuff. Uh, so yeah, just swap out your hooks. It's easy enough to swap them back. You don't have to do all of them, but just bring it on the boat with you. And if you want to swap one out, just then do it there. Yeah, you can have treble hooks, but if you if you've got a treble hook on a rod. Or a barb yeah, you get and you get checked. You're, even if you didn't even touch that rod, you're gonna you're gonna get a fine. So um, just be careful about that, and and look out for these fish. I mean, there's so many people up there targeting these fish. There's so many people that are already are breaking the rules and killing fish. So yeah, make a... sure that you're you're one of the ones that's that's doing the right thing. Um, and if you have any questions about this, I mean, we'll go over this at the end. But but reach out to me and John. Like if you're one, a guy like us that's got a boat and wants to get up there and give it a shot. I mean, it's there's plenty of room for people to come up there and and try it and to learn and to it's a cool it's just a fun area where all the guides and all the you know anglers that we know around the state kind of join up in the spring hang out fish yeah know, it's it's fun it's like beers. a guide kind of guide reunion yeah definitely everybody ends up up there and it's it's a good time it is a good time so i i, I wanted to dive into a little bit about what john was saying as far as the retrieve he was talking about kind of fly style i find myself more times than not um jigging so i'm kind of so if a lot of times too, if I'm throwing a spinning rod, I'm sitting a little more stationary than a fly. Even if I'm, um, dri like even if I'm fishing the lower river, I I'm I'm slowing myself down with the trolling motor as I'm drifting, because that that jig's gonna sink so much better, so much quicker, and you can kind of bounce it and work through the water a little bit better that way. Um, but one thing that I'm excited to try this year that I haven't that Alan does a little bit more of is fishing the swim baits because. Even for trout, this this past winter, one thing that I've started doing is swimming a swim bait, which is crazy. Like I've always fished a paddle tail, 
on a jig head, but still jigging it. And like, I've kind of slowly realized like, all right, you know, you can't just throw this out here and just slow retrieve it. And it looks like a, you know, a normal bait fish just swimming in the current. Mm-hmm. And that has changed the game for me for speckled trout. <laughs> just not realizing you don't always have to, I mean, with a fluke or something like that, if you just kind of slow reel a fluke, it'll still get eaten, but it really has no action. Um, but a paddle tail, man, that just looks just like a bait fish swimming. So as I'm slow drifting, I think that just slow reel with no twitches, maybe one or two twitches every once in a while is going to be a pretty deadly method. Um, yeah. But 90% of the guys you see up there are going to be throwing, you know, the baits are going to be throwing, they're going to be bouncing them off the bottom and letting them fall. And with a swim bait, that's still important as that bait's falling, that tail's just kicking like crazy as it's going down to the bottom. Yeah, um, yeah so I forgot to mention earlier, with, with the jig heads, a lot of times we're fishing mostly three-eighths. Yeah. Uh, sometimes a half, sometimes a quarter, um, but a lot of three eight ounce jig heads. Do you play around with the weedless hooks much, or usually just go with the jig heads? Usually just go with the jig heads. The hook riding up tends to uh, stay off the bottom. The other thing too is it's there's so much current that it's not even it doesn't matter if it's weedless or not. It's like if your bait hits something, it's just getting swept underneath it. Right. So it's just getting wrapped around stuff. The hook might not even be hung up on it. The current's just got it pinned around a stick or something like that. So. Yeah, that's what I was saying earlier about running a leader on the end of your braid. Yeah, so that you can break it off. Definitely, definitely. Um, and cheap, cheap jig heads is is the ticket. I, I like to fish my eye strike jig heads up there. The hookup ratio is really good, and I'll usually start out fishing eye strike when I get up there, and then I'm like, all right, I gotta break yeah, out. You blow through about twenty four of them in a day. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, all right, I gotta go to something cheap. So come up there if you're gonna come up for a couple of days. Make sure you're stocked up on tackle. I mean, one or two packs of flukes and jig heads isn't gonna cut it. Yeah, bring bring all your stuff before you come because there's, so there's our secret spot and there's a Walmart up there and that's about it and it'll get, it's such a big to do up there that it gets run through pretty quick. Oh yeah, it gets run through real quick. So order your stuff up and 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 go ahead and, and get locked in. But like like we were saying at the beginning, that that river is already fishing well. So I think we're heading up there the 25th of this month, uh, maybe the 26th of this month. Um, sometime about then. And sometime about, about ten. 10, 12 days, yeah. two weeks, something like that. But, I mean, if you've got a free day, go ahead and head up there. It's a cool river. And um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else that that is important to share about, about Weldon and the Roanoke River? Uh, well, a couple things. One is that it's a it's a great conservation story. Um, yeah. There's a huge plaque right there at the boat ramp that tells you all about it, how in the, the late 80s, early 90s, they had kind of wiped out the run due to pollution, and um, they didn't know much about what the fish needed to, as far as current to, to spawn and the eggs to tumble and how long they needed. So they've, they've done a really good job figuring it out. And, uh, now it's, I think the largest run anywhere on the East coast. Um, I think they say almost a third of the fish, um, the striper stock on the East coast runs up that river to spawn, which is, which is crazy. So that is crazy. Uh, I think it's about three quarters of a million to a million fish a year run up there to spawn. Yeah. It's an insane amount of fish. It's, is the number um so that and then two things there's a there's a keeper season which runs through april um, and it can be really crowded up there all all the days of the week and then may 1st keeper season goes out um so you can't keep any more fish there's a slot limit was a two fish a day uh, per person 18, yeah per person 18 to 22 i think so 20, i always have to look that up every year i always forget yeah, one over 26 i believe yep or two in the slot yep um, um. Yeah, that's important to remember. So don't go up there and just bop a bunch of them after May 1st because that, that's when yeah. keeper season's over. And just Thank because you. you're fishing, say you don't want to keep striper and you go up there early and there's 300 boats on the water, you can still crush them. I mean, the boat pressure is frustrating as an angler because it's, oh, I'm dealing with all these other boats. It's obviously nice to fish an area that you kind of have to yourself. But there's plenty of fish and they eat really well. So don't be nervous when you get to the ramp and there's like 300 trucks up there. There's still plenty of fish to be caught. Um, and stick around, get there early as crap, like get there before the sun comes up. And so many people are gone like an hour before, you know, the sun goes down. But the best fishing, man, is like my favorite time is right there in the evening until dark, like right up until dark. Yeah, it's you just, can get them. God, they shoot so good. And everyone's gone. Fish I probably shouldn't share late. that. <laughs> fish early and fish late. Yeah, the way that we're running our trips mostly are four-hour trips, half days. Or if somebody books a full day, we're taking a siesta in the middle of the day. And that bite's really hot from like right when the sun starts to come up till about 10 o'clock. And then it shuts yeah, down from like 11, 12, 1, 2, and then like around 3 usually it starts firing off again. And me and John have kind of started to get some uh, some common carp 
on the fly dialed in. Yeah, we found some found some carp up there. There's a ton of carp on Roanoke Rapids Lake that no one fishes for. That's that's, that's for a different that's, time. Yeah, it's a different time. It's a different time. We'll, but uh, even with with it fishing late, you know, if you're in, if you're in Raleigh or Rocky Mountain or Richmond or anything like that, you can you can cut out of work a little bit early and get up there and catch yeah, that evening. Yeah, right? definitely. Yeah, that's what I used to do as a kid uh, living in Raleigh in middle school, and we we would get out of school at three and jet up there and fish for two hours and catch a bunch of striped bass in the evening. So. Up there, you'll hear me call them striped bass right now, and I hang around Weldon for like a day or two, and I start calling them rockfish. So. Rock, rockfish. <laughs> rocks. So we had this guy, rock. Brian Saunders, on from Newburn, and he just calls them rocks. He's like, yeah, the rocks are biting real good. And I'm like, that's pretty. That's North Carolina right there, rocks. I like that. Um, but, you know, a lot of other states they have no clue what we're saying if we say rockfish. So you gotta, you got to got to play to the to the dealer. But, um, well, cool. Well, yeah, that's, those are some good, great points. Uh, lots of hotels to stay at there in the Weldon yep. area. Um, just be careful this year with that virus going around. Uh, it's it's uh, There's some campgrounds as well, and you're right near Lake Gaston, so there's a ton of really good Airbnbs um, if you want to come up for a couple yeah, days for an Airbnb, a campgrounds, hang out and fish. So um, hopefully we'll see you all up there on the river. Um, if you do want to book a trip, I'm going to link John's um, information as well as mine in the show notes um, here on the podcast as well as on the YouTube channel. Um, so give us a give us a holler, and we'll uh, we'd love to get out on the water with you. But um, John, thanks for coming on, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, I think we're going to try to do another uh, live stream one night from Weldon, so get a couple guides around the table um, and just kind of, who knows, who knows what we'll talk about. Yeah, see, we'll see what happens. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'll, I'm going to close it out real quick. And uh, yeah, thanks for checking that one out. I uh, just want to kind of give you all the intel on the, such a cool fishery that we have here in North Carolina, um, as well as, you know, plug me and me and John's guide business a little bit. And uh, hopefully we we can uh, book a few trips through this, but e- even if you don't want to book a trip and you have questions about how to go up there and successfully target those, those rockfish or striped bass, if you will, um, hit us up. We're happy to help out. Um, it, we, it's just a cool fishing community up there. So um, it's definitely not a secret. And uh, it seems like the, the way it goes is the more the merrier up there. Um, but again, thanks for checking out Eastern Current and uh, we will see you on the next episode later.